For my talk today, I'm going to do somewhat the same as Frank and Nina, is to review the history of the school and introduce you to its principal owners and their ideas about education for girls and young women. I want to point out that everything that we know about the school is really based on promotional materials. So we have to think about that, um, who were the audiences for these materials, primarily the parents. So I don't have as many um, as much to say about what the young women's actual experiences were. We have some photographs, but they were often posed. And this photograph that you see here, which was from a catalog, as, as sweet as it is, of course, was posed. So um, that's just a, a little disclaimer. Um, uh, it, and all, throughout, though, what I want to just point out is this kind of tension that that Frank um, brought up as he was looking at statistics in his last slides, which is a, a, a kind of a tension between the original finishing mission of the school when it was first founded in 1903 and the changing um, social roles and expectations for women by the 1940s, the last decade that the school operated. Okay. Now, many of you who are here today, I know you already know um, that the building in which the Chevy Chase Seminary um, opened was originally the Chevy Chase Springs Hotel, later the Chevy Chase Inn. And it was built by the land company um, a, as a hotel, a, a, another uh, development designed to bring people to the new, newly designed suburb. Um, it was designed by Lindley Johnson, uh, Johnson um, and it was opened in 1894. It was successful in the summertime. Um, but in the wintertime, it was not. Um, people just didn't really want to make the trip out and stay in Chevy Chase in the winter. Um, and so um, in order to make it pay, um, um, the property was um, uh, leased out, rented out, to Mademoiselle Leah Bellini um, for several years. Um, I know that for at least three years um, that she had it, and perhaps longer. Um, several ads have appeared in Harper's and, and the Evening Star. This one, this ad is from 1897, and you see the top ad, which I clipped from the newspaper, is for Chevy Chase, her school. Um, at, but down at the bottom, you'll see Mount Vernon, all right? So <laughs> they're part of the same crowd, um, but certainly influenced by um, Mrs. Summers, certainly. So um, the Barkers, um, um, uh, Sam, uh, Samuel Barker and his wife Mary um, bought the house um, and property, um, and they turned it into the school, of course. Um, and they had been teachers at Sullins College in Bristol, Virginia. Now, I don't know very much about them, so um, I, I hope we will find out more about them. Maybe someone here does know about them. But, but we do know that they, that they worked at this other school. Um, and they opened the school in 1903, that very same year. Um, and then in 1917, um, they sold the school uh, to uh, Dr. Frederick Farrington and his wife, Isabel Scudder Farrington. Now, the Scudders would, would operate the school um, or members of their family until it closed. All was well until 1930 when um, Dr. Farrington died suddenly um, at age 56. This was a, a, a big blow, of course, and Mrs. Farrington, however, continued to run the school. She took on the title of regent, and she hired several new presidents during the 1930s, all with excellent backgrounds in education. In 1941, Mrs. Farrington herself died. Um, she left all of uh, her estate, well, not all, but 15 sixteenths is what I've been told, of her estate that would include um, the Chevy Chase School um, to her family, the Scudders. And they continued to run the school um, after her death. But by the late 1940s, um, enrollments had declined and, and the cost to operate the school um, continued to rise. The Scudder family, and the Board of Trustees at the time decided to sell the school to the Nat National 4-H organization. Now, the Scudders used the proceeds from the sale of the school to the 4-H to fund um, scholarships for missionaries. Four generations of the Scudders ha had been missionaries in India, particularly as doctors, and the Scudder Family Foundation today continues to do this work. Um, and just as a note, I'm not going to talk about it um, today, but um, uh, 
because the military's role in so many of these schools has come up, um, uh, when the 4-H buys the school, they do not um, um, uh, start uh, using it until 1959. That's when they take over the school. During the Korean War, um, the, the military takes it over um, for defense information um, purposes. So here's one of the um, early advertisements for Chevy Chase Seminary. Um, it's from 1908. Um, now, uh, it's, uh, it, the text is what I want you to look at particularly. Um, it's, uh, it, it sort of sets the tone for what all the marketing promotional materials say. So um, a home school for young women, um, it means it's a custodial safe place, of course. And it, it, it sort of telegraphs its curriculum in this other phrase, college preparatory, special, and finishing courses. And that describes the three kinds of courses. It was a high school, the, the, a senior high school, that is the last three years of high school until 1947. And then it offered a collegiate and a finishing course. Um, sports is very important. Golf and other outdoor activities. And the campus, the size of the campus for 11 acres, this could see, this would be great in terms of com competing with Mrs. Summers, perhaps. Um, um, <laughs> healthy location, beautiful Chevy Chase suburb of Washington. This um, suburban location is a constant theme in marketing materials because it, it says to parents that they need not fear that the evils of the city will ever affect them, right? So their children, their daughters are safe here. And in fact, so this is from the Barkers era, it's one of their first advertisements, but the Farringtons um, also talked about the suburban location of the school in their catalogs. And in the very first um, Farrington catalog in 1917, Dr. Farrington wrote, we are of the city, but not in the city. We are of the country, but not in the country. So it's very clear about the special suburban location. Now, in the early years, the classes were very small. They didn't start out with 40 students, which is or, or plus as um, National Park Seminary did. That's amazing. But um, there, in 1906, there were only six graduates. So that gives you an idea of the, the whole student body. Um, but uh, it grows. Um, and by the 1911 catalog, the Barkers claimed to have students from 22 states plus Canada. Now, the, the, the question, I think, is, that it's, is an interesting um, bit of information that tells us about how much, what, the, what the class um, uh, identity is of the young women who went there. Um, the tuition was $600, but in today's dollars, that's about $14,000. Well, that's probably what you would pay for a private school, but there were many extras, many extras, music lessons, elocution, drawing, dancing, riding, fencing. Each of those special courses would cost an extra $100 to $120. So it could cost something more than $20,000 or more um, in today's dollars. So clearly, the students who went there um, were from wealthy families. And even laundry was a charge, of course. <laughs> um, um, now, although there was regional diversity at the school, um, as the Barkers claimed in 1911, um, there's no doubt, um, as I said, that only wealthy families could afford to send their children there, their daughters there. But we, in terms of their racial or ethnic background, we really don't know with any certainty except for the few photographs we see. Um, and in later years, we do see the names of students that we think might be the daughters of uh, diplomats, for instance. But, but we don't know for sure. We don't have records of, of the student population. One thing I want to say, though, in, in, in this um, regard is that um, while we don't know much about the students, we do have census records for the people who lived on the property and worked there. Um, and it's quite interesting. The, uh, the Barkers, for instance, would have administrators that were, lived there on site, but the help that made the school work were predominantly black. 
Um, on the left, you see one of the postcards signed and sent by Dr. Barker in 1906. Postcards at this time are a really popular way of communicating. And um, he has written there um, that a new catalog is coming out soon. So it's like a way for him to keep in touch with, with parents or a prospective student. Um, the Barkers also sought publicity in local newspapers. And um, Mrs. Barker told the Washington Post in 1911, it is our purpose to make the social life in the college especially attractive. We have receptions and course dinners at which certain young ladies act as hostesses and are responsible for the pleasure of the guests for the evening. This gives a girl ease of manner and a sense of making herself attractive and giving pleasure to others. We try to train in all the maidenly graces. But we know from postcards from, about, from girls a little bit about what they thought. This is one little area that we have a few glimpses of what, what the students might have thought. This postcard on, on your right was sent in 1907, probably by a Chevy Chase student. We're pretty sure it's a postcard. Um, it, telling someone that it's a dandy place with lots of nice girls. So. And the photograph on your left is um, from a, a, a catalog showing the students meeting the mail truck. Right? So getting more of those postcards, no doubt. Well, the Barkers um, uh, provided um, detailed description of their academic curriculum, just um, as um, uh, Frank described for National Park Seminary, and I'm, I'm, and I'm sure for Mount Vernon as well. Um, and again, this was to appeal to parents. Um, so uh, the students took classes in American history, European, Greek, and Roman history. All of the things that, that Frank has already talked about, a quite rigorous uh, uh, program. Um, but there's one interesting part about it. They didn't take exams. No. No. And the Barkers said in their catalog, an examination serve only as, as nervous, exhausted, to hardworking, sensitive girls, and at best are on satisfactory tests of work actually done. We have abolished them. Now, they also go on to claim that their, their teachers are so skilled and they and work so closely with their students that, they're, that again, it's easy to understand um, how um, students are progressing. And it's interesting when we have debates about testing today to, to think about the Barker's um, policy. Um, the academic classes, um, similar to other schools, were, were, were very structured during the day. The classes were mostly um, um, from 8.30 until lunchtime. And studying would be done um, after dinner from 7.30 to 9.30. The afternoons were um, the time for the special classes, domestic sciences, physical education, music, and art. And on the left, you see a photograph of a sewing class from 1914. Now, the students for this class wouldn't be expected to make their own clothing, but this was um, so that they would be able to supervise um, work that they would um, expect from someone else. Um, there were always commencement um, speakers, um, and these got picked up in the newspapers, so we get to know a little bit about them. Dr. Barker himself delivered the commencement address in 1909, and he discouraged Chevy Chase students from becoming involved in the, the suffragist movement. He didn't want them to have anything to do with that. Their focus should be on the home, and he said that in his, in his address, uh, as reported in the Washington Post. In 1911, um, uh, Champ Clark, the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, gave the graduation address. And here's uh, just a little bit of his speech. Girls, this is the most important certificate that you will possess until someday you go with some healthy young American to the county clerk and get a marriage license. <laughs> and then he went on to say, and judging from the looks, I expect you'll all receive offers. Anyway. Um, When the Farringtons um, uh, take over the school, um, you know, they continue many of the, the programs that the Barkers had set up, but they have a slightly different approach. Um, Dr. Farrington um, had a PhD from Columbia in education um, and had done extensive research about um, the French system of education. His wife was also very well educated, having attended Mount Holyoke. Um, and other schools. And so in their first catalog, they wrote about 
the modern movement in girls' education, and the worldwide movement for the emancipation of women. But they believe that women's chief work will inevitably be in the home. This sounds a little bit like Mount Vernon here. Um, thus, Chevy girls should be able to read and write and speak the English language. They should know mathematics, all the better to handle household accounts. Their social studies should focus on social progress. This um, idea of social service also was very important to the Farringtons. And instead of Latin and Greek, they should learn modern languages and develop linguistic pluralism, to use their words. Um, the, these, are, these, in, these kinds of shifts, I think, are, are really part of a kind of movement for progressive ideas about education in general. And it's interesting that the Farringtons are really right in the thick of that. Dr. Farrington was involved in um, organizations about junior colleges. So what did the young women think about their, their futures? Well, we have a little bit of evidence from the 1930s. Um, in 1938, two Chevy Chase students in a journalism class, it, that was a, one of the classes that was offered, Alice Skinker and Anita Mamaly developed a survey of the entire body of 77 students. And the Washington Post actually published that in their report. The headline in the Washington Post was, Chevy Chase girls favor matrimony over careers. But I want to point out that the data says that, it says more than half wanted to marry within a year of graduation, but that was 52%. So it's, it's you know, barely more than half, right? Just saying, anyway. Um, but, and a, but they wanted to marry, and a majority of them also hoped to have children. According to the Post, 7% of the girls consider themselves capable of handling a career and marriage simultaneously, while 8% of the girls surveyed felt they would like to get started in their jobs before they spared any time for wedding plans. Right. Well, we don't know if this survey um, had any um, influence on Mrs. Farrington, who was now running the school as the regent. Um, but in the following year, she purchased a single-family single home, and you can see it today. Its number then was 3 Thornapple Street, um, to serve as a domestic practice house. Small groups of students lived at the house for short periods while taking their regular classes. They planned meals, bought groceries, budgeted household expenses, and just like the Chevy Chase students um, who went there when the Barkers were the principals, they practiced their social skills as hostesses for luncheons, dinners, and teas. Except this time, it's in a real Chevy Chase suburban home. This experiential um, learning approach in the domestic realm was also was complemented by a new academic curriculum. Um, in 1940, uh, uh, Kendrick Marshall, who was appointed president at that time, he was a political scientist, announced a program that would combine firsthand observation of, of congressional decision making with seminars and coursework. And in the lower right, you can see a photograph of Chevy girls interviewing a member of Congress. Um, now, what happens is Mr. Marshall left the school in 1942 to join the war effort. And of course, during that time, um, Chevy Chase girls are also participating in the war effort at home, um, part, in being part of Red Cross and other service work appropriate for young women then. Another, uh, one last kind of, um, section that I want to just mention briefly is social dancing. If um, the parents of Chevy Chase um, uh, seminary students wanted them to be prepared for marriage, then they would want them to meet suitable um, young men. And so social dancing has a role in that. And um, uh, parents expected their daughters would attend social events um, that would be properly chaperoned. Um, but a controversy arose when the Barkers were um, at principals at the school. Um, it's at the height of, this, of a dance craze. It's called the animal dance craze. Um, <laughs> As, as the jazz, as jazz music influenced popular culture, um, new forms of social dancing spread across the country. Um, and these were the, the things like the scandalous tango, which meant people touching each other, um, and the turkey trot. Um, and in 1913, the Washington Post published this article because there was a dilemma for the GW students. 
their faculty had voted that they could do some of these dances and there was no problem. But of course, the invitation from Chevy Chase said that none of these dances would be allowed. And in the paper, Mrs. Barker is quoted as, as saying that only the waltz and the two-step could be danced. The dance card on, on, on your left, on the lower left, is actually um, uh, from William Arlett um, from the same period, and it's, it's, it alternates between waltz and two-step. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, in the post-war era, um, the, the, um, the school went through some of the, the many problems that, that the other schools went through. But um, in 1942, Carrie Sutherland was appointed president, and she was the former president of Arlington Hall Junior College, and I mention that because it's one of the schools that was taken over again for the war effort in World War II. Um, she saw a dramatic rise in enrollment uh, under her leadership, 119 students in 1946. That's the highest that it ever was. But uh, apparently enrollment dropped right away. Um, so I don't know all the story there, but she resigned and returned to teaching at Longwood. And the dean at the time, Francis Brown, serves in president until it closes. Um, they continued, um, the school continued to promote um, many different events and uh, started a capital improvement program. Um, the brochure on the right is, is something that featured um, many graduates who went to four-year colleges. Um, but if you notice the map, another promotional piece from the same period, it still really is kind of focusing on the suburban landscape next to the um, exclusive country club and riding stables. So there are these kind of problems. They couldn't quite figure out how to position the school, apparently. So after graduation in the spring of 1950, this is the graduating class of 1950, Students believed that Chevy Chase would open as usual in the fall, but it was not to be. The school sent letters to all of its continuing students over the summer, and it, it turns out that the best efforts of the Scudder family and the Board of Trustees, they just couldn't find a way to, to make it work. So the finishing school was no longer the most attractive choice for wealthy young women and their parents in this era. And it was certainly not a viable business for the Scudder family. Chevy Chase Junior College closed for good in 1950.